I told you that a dis-ease can have a creative basis, and so can an earthquake or a natural disaster. Now, on other than conscious levels, simply as creatures, you are well aware of impending storms, floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, and so forth. There are many hints and signs picked up by the body itself. Alterations in air pressure, magnetic orientation in terms of balance, minute electrical differentiations of which the skin itself is aware. On that level, the body is often prepared for natural calamities before they occur. Defenses are set up. Many additional issues operate, however, that have to do with any given personal reaction. Here, other psychological conditions enter in. People live in regions threatened by earthquakes with clear conscious knowledge of them. Regardless of what they might say, they need and enjoy the constant stimuli and excitement. The very unpredictable nature of the circumstances arouses them to action. There are many different attitudes and characteristics that apply, so that it is difficult to make generalizations. But there are always reasons why any individual is involved in a disastrous natural catastrophe. In many cases, a near-conscious realization of the circumstances occurs beforehand. In other cases, the body's foreknowledge is reflected in dreams, and so alters daily life that an escape plan takes place. Some people change their plans and leave town a day before a disaster comes about. Others stay. None of this is accidental. Unconscious material is admitted into consciousness according to those beliefs an individual holds about himself, his reality, and his place in it. No one dies in a disaster who has not chosen to do so. There is always some conscious recognition, however, though the individual may play tricks with himself and pretend it is not there. Even animals sense their dying ahead of time, and on that level, man is no different. Those who want to use their unconscious precognition of such an event will take advantage of it, save themselves, and choose not to be involved. If they do not believe in such advanced warnings and deny themselves conscious knowledge, yet still believe in their overall security, they will unconsciously act without knowledge of their reasons. There will be others who are a part of the calamity for their own reasons. Psychically, mentally, and physically, they will be as much a part of such an event as, say, the water that sweeps through a town in a flood. They will utilize the physical catastrophe as an individual might use a symptom for purposes of challenge, growth, or understanding, but they will choose their disaster just as they will choose their symptoms. They will be aware of the framework, therefore. It will not be thrust upon them. They may not consciously accept such information, but if they knew how to examine themselves, they would discover that their beliefs added up to precisely the given kind of situation. An illness of a severe nature may be used by an individual to put him or her into the most intimate contact with the powers of life and death to initiate a crisis in order to mobilize buried survival instincts, to vividly portray great points of contrast, and summon all of his or her strength. So can a catastrophe be used consciously or unconsciously according to the individual. Now, again, there are no accidents. No one dies under any circumstances who is not prepared to die. This applies to death through natural catastrophe, as well as to any other situation. Your own choice will dictate the way you die, as well as the time. We are dealing now with your beliefs as you know them in this life, and leaving for a later chapter any bleed-throughs of beliefs that may occur from other existences. But whatever beliefs you accept, for whatever reasons, your point of power is in the present. It is far more important that you understand this than that you become overly concerned with labyrinthian quote-unquote past reasons, for you can get so lost in a negative approach that you forget that these beliefs can be changed in the present. For various reasons, you hold beliefs that you can alter at any time. Many individuals die young, for example, because they believe so strongly that old age represents a degradation of the spirit and an insult to the body. They do not want to live under the conditions as they believe them to be. Some, quite frankly, prefer to die in what others would consider to be the most dire circumstances, swept away by the ravaging waves of an ocean, or crushed in an earthquake, or battered by the winds of a hurricane. Slow death in a hospital, or an experience with an illness, would be unthinkable to these same people. 
Some of this has to do with temperament and with quite normal individual differences and preferences. Many more human beings are aware of their own impending deaths than is generally known. They know and yet pretend they do not know, but those who die in catastrophes choose the experience, the drama, even the terror when that occurs. They prefer to leave physical life in a blaze of perception, battling for their lives at a point of challenge, quote-unquote fighting, and not acquiescent. Natural disasters possess the great rousing energy of powers unleashed, of nature escaping man's discipline, and by their very characteristics also remind man of his own psyche, for in their way such profound events always involve creativity being born, rising even from the bowels of the earth, reshaping the land and the lives of men. Individual reactions follow this innate knowledge, for while man fears the unleashed power of nature and tries to protect himself from it, he revels in it and identifies with it at the same time. The more quote-unquote civilized man becomes, the more his social structures and practices separate him from intimate relationship with nature, and the more natural catastrophes there will be, because underneath he senses his great need for identification with nature. He will himself conjure it into earthquakes, tornadoes, and floods, so that he can once again feel not only their energy, but his own. As nothing else can, a great encounter with the full energy of the elements puts a man face to face with the incredible potency from which he springs. For many people, a natural calamity provides their first personal experience with the realities of creaturehood's connection with the planet. Under such conditions, men who feel a part of nothing, of no structure or family or country, can understand in a flash their comradeship with the earth, their place upon it and its energy, through suddenly recognizing that relationship, they feel their own power for action. On quite a different level, riots also serve the same purpose, where the release of energy, for whatever reasons, introduces a group of individuals to the intimate recognition that highly concentrated vitality exists. They may not have found it earlier in their lives. This recognition can lead them, and often does, to seize their own energy and use it in a strong creative manner. A natural catastrophe or a riot are both energy baths, potent and highly positive in their ways despite their obvious connotations. In your terms, this in no way absolves those who start riots, for example, for they will be working within a system of conscious beliefs in which violence begets violence. Yet even here, individual differences apply. The inciters of riot are often searching for the manifestation of energy which they do not believe that they possess on their own. They light and start psychological fires and are as transfixed by the results as any arsonist. If they understood and could experience power and energy in themselves, they would not need such tactics. As racial problems may be worked out on many levels, through a riot or a natural disaster or a combination of both, according to the intensity of the situation on a psychological level, and as symptoms can be pleas for help and recognition, so can natural misfortunes be utilized by members of one portion of the country or one part of the world to obtain aid from other portions. Obviously, many riots are quite consciously instigated. Certainly, thousands of individuals or millions of them do not consciously decide to bring about a hurricane or a flood or an earthquake in the same manner. In the first place, on that level they do not believe such a thing possible. While conscious beliefs have a part to play in such cases, on an individual basis, the quote-unquote inner work is done just as unconsciously as the body produces physical symptoms. The symptoms often seem to be inflicted upon the body, just as a natural disaster seems to be visited upon the body of the earth. Sudden illnesses are thought of as frightening and unpredictable with the sufferer a victim, perhaps, of a virus. Sudden tornadoes or earthquakes are seen in the same light as the result of air currents and temperature, or fault lines instead of viruses. The basic causes of both, however, are the same. There are as many reasons, then, for quote-unquote earth illnesses as there are for body illnesses. To some extent, the same can be said of wars, if you consider a war as a small infection. In the case of a world war, it would be a massive disease. War will finally teach you to revere life. 
natural catastrophes will remind you that you cannot ignore your planet or your creaturehood. At the same time, such experiences themselves provide contact with the deepest energies of your being, even when they are being used, quote-unquote, destructively.